Hello to everyone who's watching. Um, my name is Emily and I'm a programmer for the Maisel's Documentary Center. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with the organization, we're a nonprofit cinema and education center founded by Albert Maisel's, um, who is a documentary filmmaker. Um, and usually we're located in Harlem um, and that's where we screen documentaries in our 51 seat cinema and offer documentary filmmaking education program for young people in Harlem. And um, so under these new circumstances, we've been able to continue our operations online. So we've been screening documentary runs and curated series in our virtual cinema. Um, and also we've been able to move our education programs to remote learning platforms. Um, so those have been able to continue as well. Um, so we've been figuring out how to uh, make films from home too. Um, and I'm incredibly delighted to be introducing today's program, Queer Harlem Renaissance, presented by Shoga Films. And um, Queer Harlem Renaissance falls within an ongoing series at Maisel's called Made in Harlem, which is in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance, or 100th-ish. Um, and the series brings together a variety of film sources to examine visual representations of the Harlem Renaissance, mostly non-fictional and documentaries, uh, and the lasting influence of these representations on political and artistic output, on collective memory, on present day black experiences, and um, Harlem today. So we've had to reorganize the series a little bit as we transition to the digital world, um, but it's been really amazing to collaborate with uh, all the good folks at Shoga Films uh, to move forward with this program, um, even though it's not how we originally uh, expected it would go. So uh, please check our website, mazels.org. Um, we'll be announcing more virtual programs in the Made in Harlem series there. Uh, and we've had some really amazing dynamic screenings and discussions on these topics already, uh, including William Miles's four hour documentary history, I Remember Harlem, which was back in February before we closed. Um, and then also just a few weeks ago, we screened Isaac Julian's Looking for Langston. Uh, which, as many of you know, uh, fits in quite nicely with um, the Queer Harlem Renaissance program. And all of the films will be available at measles.org for another week. So if you haven't had a chance to watch them yet, I highly recommend it. And um, the last thing I'll say is that um, if anyone watching has any questions during the discussion, feel free to type them directly into the chat feature. And then once the panelists open it up for um, audience uh, Q&A, then they'll be able to answer your questions directly via the chat. Um, so that was a lot of information, but uh, with all that in mind, I'm really happy to introduce Marcus Harris, who's the digital producer for Afronaut Media and works with Shoga Films, and uh, Marcus is going to be moderating today's discussion. So uh, thanks, Marcus. Great. Thank you, Emily. We appreciate Maisel's uh, having us here. And we hope that once the world gets back to a little bit of sense of normality, we will be able to join you and in, in share real space with you uh, outside of the virtual platforms and hopefully do a screening at the Maisel's Documentary Center in Harlem. So, uh, but right now we appreciate everybody who's joining us virtually. And I wanna say thank you to you for participating. And I wanna say thank you to our panel uh, who's here. First and foremost, we have Dr. Robert Phillipson of Shoga Films, a producer and filmmaker. Hello, Robert, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Great, great. And Robert is a former academic professor of African-American studies with a passion for jazz and African-American art. Uh, a published author, he is also a historian of the Harlem Renaissance and has produced multiple films about the intersectionality between race and music and sexuality. Uh, we also have another one of our Shoga producers with us, Khalil Sullivan. Hello, Khalil. Hey, how you doing? Khalil, I'm doing well. Um, Khalil is a, a is the lead singer of the Oakland-based ensemble Mad Noise. He's also one of our producers specializing in the music department who's um, who works with us. He's also a guitarist for a San Francisco-based punk rock band, and he's currently developing music about performances of Black Lives at the 1901 World's Fair in Buffalo, New York. Uh, maybe we'll get a chance to talk to you a little bit more about your projects as well outside of Shoga Films, Khalil, and how they also incorporate in the work that you're doing as an academic with us. We also have Anna Puchmara. Did I say that correctly? 
Pochmara. <laughs> Pochmara, I'm sorry, who's joining us all the way from Warsaw. Uh, and she is a assistant professor of American literature and is currently, uh, currently a graduate student with a Fulbright scholarship grant to do research for her doctoral project at Yale University. And she is at the Institute of English Studies for the University of Warsaw. How are you doing today, Anna? Great. How are you? I'm doing well. I apologize about the name again. So, uh, <laughs> no problem. We also have Kaylin Rivers, who's an actor. Hello, Kaylin, are you hey. there? <laughs> great, great. We're so happy to have you. And it's our second time getting to touch base. You were actually a part of our, uh, our new project, an actor in our new project, Smoke Lilies and Jade, which is hopefully going to be released at the end of this year or next, early next year in 2021. Uh, you are also hailing from the great city of Chicago, right? So enjoyed those last dance documentaries, did you? <laughs> oh, I love them. Listen, <laughs> listen, <laughs> hometown glory right there. Yes, yes. And you also hold, uh, she also holds a BFA in acting from the University of Illinois at, Ch at Urbania Champaign. Um, she currently resides in Los Angeles, where she's joining us from and where you can see her in various commercials, short films, TV shows, web series, as well as doing work behind the scenes. Uh, thank you for, for joining us as well. Well, thank you for having me. Great, great. So for those of you that wanna know more about Shoga, you can check us out on shogafilms.com. We are doing a project, this is all part of a project called the Queer Harlem Renaissance, which is essentially a uh, anthology of short films and documentaries regarding the LGBT community and showcasing the LGBTQ community of the Harlem Renaissance that is little known and, and unfortunately unsung in many ways. And we found that during the course of this project that a lot of people are just now starting to really dive into this topic and, and really highlight some of these artists uh, who were greatly influenced by their sexuality and their art uh, and how it portrays in their art. And with the Harlem Renaissance being such an important part of black culture and identity, I actually wanted to start the questioning with a quick, a quick uh, question for Khalil. Um, as, as a black artist, and we've had many discussions about this personally, why do you feel that the Harlem Renaissance is such an important uh, cultural aspect for bl the black community? Well, I think uh, it's a great question. I think we're at a time of revisionist history where people are going back to look at the history we learned in the school systems and various other places in our culture and uncovering the stories of marginalized people, people who were left out, people who were silenced. And that has a great benefit for the culture at large, especially for those communities, because they get to go back and understand their particular place in history and how um, the culture, how our certain countries, how capitalism has affected them. And that process is a healing one. That process is a rejuvenating one. So uh, I think as the, as, the, as the cultures, the mainstream cultures get more mindful of how to respect those stories and histories, uh, we're taking that journey together. Um, and that's part of the process. The Harlem Renaissance is a great fountain of knowledge about African-American history, but as also it's a way to expand upon our notion of what it means to be black uh, in America and to be black in the diaspora. Yes, yes. In Harlem specifically, uh, as a Harlemite myself, I can tell you the importance of the community aspect of the Harlem Renaissance and how uh, it being a representation of, of, of black pride in the community. Um, do you, I know the big, one of the big main, uh, one of the main focus points of the Queer Harlem Renaissance Project is to also highlight, like I said, to highlight the uh, queer community, the LGBTQ community of the Harlem Renaissance. Robert, why was that so important for you as the primary producer and uh, principal of Shoga Films to, to tell those stories uh, and highlight that aspect of the queer community in relation to the Harlem Renaissance? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, I first was introduced to um, the uh, queer dimensions of the Harlem Renaissance when I was uh, teaching the Harlem Renaissance in, uh, in literature classes. And the typical curriculum at that, and this was in the, this was in the late 90s, was 
poetry, uh, novels written by Harlem Renaissance writers. Ones that everybody knows about is Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. Um, but I kept running into these references to alternative sexualities. This person was bisexual or this person was actually uh, gay. And there were uh, hints scattered throughout articles and biographies, but uh, nothing had yet been brought under uh, uh, one umbrella, so to speak. When I transitioned into filmmaking, I was already pretty familiar with the um, literary aspect of the Harlem Renaissance. And um, as I continued my research, I, I became uh, uh, more convinced that this was a subject that was deserving of greater excavation. I started by making the shorter films, some of which are featured here, and have continued working in this area for the last 12 years. And as far as I know, I'm still the only person working in this area, at least in the film world. There's been a tremendous amount of, of, of uh, academic research that's brought new information to life. Great, great. And so uh, my next question is actually gonna be for, for Kaylin as a participant of the project in terms of being an actor on the film. Can you explain a little bit about your, about your, uh, how you gain knowledge on the subject? I know you worked with the Gosfields and they brought you into the project. The Gosfields are actually the, um, and we'll go back and talk a little bit about them, but how did you first get acquainted with the storytelling of these historical documentaries into now narrative forms? Um, I would say this is my, uh, Smoke Lily, Lilies and Jade was my first time working on a project specifically set uh, during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, my knowledge of it just comes from my background and my upbringing. I grew up in a very pro-Black household. Uh, my household was very, you have to know where you come from in order to know where you're going. Um, with that being said, I was fortunate enough to become friends with Gosfields through family, friends that became family here in Los Angeles. So my experience working on the set was tremendous. Uh, there's always more information to learn about. I learned about pieces that, that I literally never knew, uh, even from watching the film from earlier. So it's very interesting to me how these stories aren't being told. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we'll touch on that later, but yeah, that sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely will. Uh, no, I appreciate that. I think that that's, you know, storytelling is such a powerful and impactful way in that culture is brought to different people. Uh, it's, it was very, when I first got in touch with uh, Robert about who was going to be on the panel and he mentioned Anna, I was very interested in, in your experience, Anna, in terms of how you learned, you know, me being from Harlem and how it's perceived, uh, the Harlem Renaissance is perceived internationally is always something that I, I, how black culture really is depicted in, in other countries. Can you explain how you really got in touch with the project and what your kind of focal point was coming in and how, what you learned a little bit more from watching the films? Uh, right. Uh, so um, actually African-American literature uh, has been very popular in Poland right now. I'm doing an anthology in Polish on James Baldwin and his works actually were translated in the 1960s and 70s into Polish. So, uh, so this was this isn't anything new or exotic, as exotic as it might seem. Um, and uh, I teach actually a course about gender and sexuality in African American literature. So uh, this year when preparing classes on the Harlem Renaissance, I found uh, some fragments uh, of, uh, of the Shoga films uh, on YouTube. And uh, I rem uh, remembered that Robert contacted me actually uh, a few months back or was it a year ago? And I, I wrote to him. So I actually used the, uh, the fragments of the films in class and my students really enjoyed them. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was, uh, it, they, they really complement the texts um, in a, so they, they uh, make the presence of non-normative sexualities in the texts even more convincing, more visible 
um, because of the, the visual media. So, uh, so the, I found that the, the film is very useful. And uh, today I watched the, the, the Congo Cabaret and uh, Prove On Me Blues. And I mean, this is just great stuff. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you uh, to, to Shoga Films in general for producing the content. I think it's a con it, it sparks a lot of conversation, which is essentially why we're here, right? So uh, it's, it's interesting to me that you brought up James Baldwin, the piece uh, that you can now stream on Maisel Documentary Center for a limited time. Uh, I believe that is going through the end of the month. Uh, our series, Queer Harlem Renaissance, is like Emily said at the beginning, is part of their Made in Harlem series. And it features about 36 minutes of uh, assorted uh, films, short stories, poems, narratives, documentaries, uh, one of which is the Queer Harlem Renaissance Perspective, which was narrated by Davi Diggs. In that, there is an opening sequence that does feature James Baldwin. Uh, Robert, can you explain a little bit? One of the things that I found funny was the interview with him starts off where he says how lucky and how privileged he feels to be what he calls the triple threat of uh, an artist who is black and queer. Um, why was that a piece, especially since it doesn't have any direct mention? James Baldwin, of course, came after the Harlem Renaissance, but why did you feel that that was a piece that needed to be included inside the context of the uh, perspective? Robert, we're getting a little bit of an audio uh, mute, it looks like. Uh, Robert, I'm, I'm going to shift that. I'm going to shift that a little bit. I'm not getting your audio. So Khalil, maybe do you have a response for that possibly? It's, it's a great quotation that, that Robert pulls. Uh, I think because James Baldwin definitely had an international audience uh, as for his work and definitely directly spoke to his existence, as you're saying, a triple threat as an artist, as, 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 as an African-American, as a black man, um, and as gay. And what we see in the Harlem Renaissance is a more subtle negotiation of those identities. And within the novels, within the poetry, within the music, the negotiation takes on different forms. So audiences today are more accustomed to hearing about- Recording, recording. Uh, we hear you, Robert, great. If you wanna jump in on this question, by all means. Um, but I think audiences today are familiar with coming out and the, the kind of outward presence of one's queer sexuality. But at that time in the 1920s, uh, because of legal pressures, because of cultural pressures, people could not be as out and proud. So there's a different negotiation happening and it produces different sets of questions and narratives within the text and the music and the culture of the Renaissance. Um, uh, Robert, please feel it free more. Cause, I mean, you're, yeah, you're I'm that. sorry. Technical difficulties. You can hear me now, right? Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, we opened with that quote because... Um, uh, it's funny, <laughs> um, but it's also, it's also, it's funny in an ironic way. Um, the interviewer was, um, uh, was uh, asking Baldwin, he says, you were, you were black, you were gay, you were in Harlem. He said, uh, it, uh, how did you, how did you start? And Baldwin leans back and he says, you really couldn't, couldn't, it, it couldn't get any better than that, meaning it couldn't get any worse. You, you just had to take it and work with it. Um, and when he, at the time of that interview, it was barely acceptable at that point to come out as black and gay. So he was really, you know, when, when, uh, you ask many people to think of a black gay writer in the past, Baldwin is usually the one that, that pops to mind because he was the first one that was uh, uh, somewhat out, although those identities were, were um, um, difficult to negotiate in the pre-Stonewall era. And uh, so the fact that he uh, acknowledged it in a humorous fashion was itself a landmark moment because previously it might have been widely known, but no interviewer would have dared ask that question. Yeah, um, one of the things that I want to touch base on as well, it, it, you know, when you talk about the, the courage that someone like Baldwin had, 
as we review the, the piece of the Queer Harlem Renaissance, and we've had this, uh, we've had, we featured this film before at the San Francisco Black Film Festival, and our discussion there, one of the things that came up specifically was involving the term queer. Uh, and how, you mentioned Stonewall, how the, the, the movement has shifted and the ownership of certain words within different communities. Queer, which in some people's view is a white term or a caucasian term uh, in itself. And I wanna talk a little bit about that because that is something, you know, I really want to understand how we define queer, and uh, for Khalil, uh, as you you know, as you expressed as a queer artist, how do you also define and work with those terminologies, and how does it relate to your culture and identification as a black artist? Ooh, those big tough questions. Uh, <laughs> what was it? Um, I'll say this much. Uh, it's funny when I came out to my aunt, who I'm very close with. You know, she's. Uh, African American woman, and she's retired. And the word queer to her was a pejorative in her time. And so when I took on that term, she was just she she, she engaged in a dialogue with me. Um, and I, I mentioned that anecdote to say that uh, communities who have been targeted by pejoratives are very much interested right now in taking control of the narrative. And taking control of the narrative means also taking control of the language that's used by them. So it's a proper, it's a process of reappropriation. It's a process of, of power and control. Um, it's funny because when I was growing up in the 1990s, I associated the term gay with whiteness uh, mm -hmm. because the individuals who were more, who had more freedom to be visible with their sexuality were, were white in, 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 the, in my mind. I remember, I remember Matthew Shepard being killed horrendously and the vocalization of, of various different causes. Um, so, you know, these terms are tough to negotiate, but they speak to an, an issue of power and taking control of stories and narratives. Uh, for me individually, queer comes out of the academic context where there are, where there are uh, a generation of academics who want to put pressure on the Stonewall era, who want to put pressure on binaries around gender and sexuality, who want to show fluidity, who want to extend uh, certain liberties to individuals to, to say for themselves who they are as opposed to have labels or gender, uh, genders put on them or sexes put on them. So queer is a term that just has more flexibility, more nuance, speaks more fluidity, um, and intersectionality itself amongst gender and sexuality as well. Robert, did you feel any, um, you know, the response for you as a, as a white male working on a project so deep, especially, and you and I have had personal conversations about the importance of the Harlem Renaissance, specifically the black culture. Uh, and I know a big part of the project is to also hopefully express how important the Harlem Renaissance also was to queer culture. Um, did you, how, how do you feel as a, as a white man participating in this conversation uh, when it comes to racial, racial terms? Uh, th this is, uh, this is terrain that I've had to negotiate before when I was teaching African American literature at NYU and a couple of the UC campuses. The first conversation, I made sure that the first conversation was always, can a white professor teach African American literature? And the, the answer that I came up with, and I, uh, 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 I think it applies to this situation as well, is that um, I can bring uh, history, uh, tools of analysis and uh, interpretation that I've been trained with. Uh, what I cannot provide is a subjective view of being black. That is, that is not something that I, can, that I can bring to the discussion. The discussion of, of any in-group, and I belong to several other, others, if not black, I'm gay, I'm Jewish. Um, uh, the uh, discussions of identity have to be complemented by um, uh, uh, perspectives from outside that group, um, especially the perspective of allies. You know, if uh, if it's the perspective of people who have prejudices against or are impossible to that group, that doesn't forward a discussion any. But I'm definitely I. Uh, I have things to bring, but I also have things to learn. 
learn, and that has been a lifelong process. It hasn't stopped, and it'll, it will never stop. So switching gears a little bit, uh, another thing that was mentioned in the piece is Richard Bruce Nugent, who wrote Smoke, Lilies, and Jade, which isn't in this uh, part of the Queer Harlem Renaissance series, but it is the, uh, the piece that Kaylin worked on with us. And I had a, a quick question about that in regards to, we talk about the term queer. Another interesting conversation that has been had in relation to the film is the term uh, of Niggerati Manor, uh, the scene in which uh, a bunch of the artists are working together and, and com conversing. A as a Black artist, for Kaylin, you know, do you feel that these stories are moving the culture forward? And how do you feel about the progression? Uh, just the fact that they would use that type of a term and now how it's being portrayed. Do you feel that the progress that's been made for others to tell their stories and live their authentic lives, especially as an artist in the industry uh, where you see people like the Janelle Monets or the Lena Whites or uh, Billy Porter, who is a part of, who is narrator of our uh, Smoke, Lilies and Jade project that's coming out. How do you feel that this is being, that this is progressing in our culture? Um, it, is your question, how do I feel about how the Harlem Renaissance is progressing in our culture? Or I just want to be specific. No, I understand. So my question is more specifically about Black culture uh, and how we are progressive over time. And I say that in an instance of uh, artists like a Janelle Monet, who mm -hmm. has recently in the last few years come out and identified as, I believe, bisexual. Uh, whereas some of the artists who are portrayed in our pieces didn't have that luxury, as Khalil was saying. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So to that point, I think that it's beautiful that the way that we're progressing, um, as most Black people know, in Black families, it's very, uh, it can be very stifling. Um, you're not always allowed to express yourself. So I think that it's beautiful the way that artists are now fully stepping into who they are and they're not afraid or ashamed to let us know. Because I think that plays a big part into it. I think there's a lot of fear surrounding it, fear about whether or not you're going to lose, you know, your fans or fear of what the industry will do and think, even in the story of Billy Porter, he started out as just a musician, you know, as a musician. And he refused to conform to this masculine idea that the music industry was trying to make him conform to. And because he refused, his music career did suffer. So I think that it's beautiful that now in 2020, uh, we have artists that can come out and it does not hurt their career in the same way that it has in the past. Great, great. And in terms of the, the tech for, for Anna, you know, as a literary professor, what do you think is the overall impact of the writers from the period? We mentioned in the piece, we mentioned Claude McKay, Langston Hughes. How did their sexuality influence the culture as, as an academic when you, when you review that with your students? So um, when I read the text with my students, a uh, uh, text by uh, County Cullen, Wallace Thurman, uh, I talk with them about Elaine Locke, who did not write about his sexuality. He was, uh, as it is stated in, in the film, uh, he was a closeted homosexual, even though everyone knew he was gay at the time. Uh, when I, I read with them text by Nugent, what I find fascinating is this diversity of different ways in which they express their sexuality that did not conform to the hegemonic standards of, uh, of being heterosexual. So you had Nugent who, uh, who uh, more or less openly declared that he uh, was bisexual or pansexual in, in the texts. Uh, you had Locke who uh, sort of uh, 
uh, conform to this bourgeois notion of uh, keeping your sexuality in the private sphere. Um, you had Thurman, who was also bisexual. Uh, so you, there, there was this whole, whole, whole variety, whole diversity of, uh, of identities that we can find in those texts expressed. So what my students find fascinating is that such a diversity existed in Harlem and that it was so many decades before uh, before Stonewall and um, right. That is, you know, when I think about what you just said in terms of the diversity, I think about also specifically our piece Congo Cabaret, uh, which was produced by the Gosfields, directed and produced by the Gosfields along with Shoga Films. Uh, and Robert, can you tell me a little bit about First, this is a two-part question for you, Robert. How does that narrative, it being the first Shoga Films narrative, how, does, how did you really reflect the diversity of the time period within that piece? Uh, my source material, Home to Harlem by Claude McKay, did, it, did the work for me. <laughs> I just had to adapt what was in the novel already. The, 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 the diversity was there. Um, so you have in uh, Congo Cabaret, you have, you have uh, what they call back then mannish women and sissy men uh, who were portrayed as such, but you also had the masculine gay who went by, uh, the slang term was wolf, and the cabaret owner is called Billy the Wolf. Uh, it's a remarkably um, open uh, portrayal of uh, the, uh, uh, the queer presence in, in the cabaret scene. Uh, so, like I said, the work was done for me. And how did the Gosfields, uh, wh what was the relationship with the Gosfields and how did they come on board? They've had so much success in the film industry, currently working, uh, I believe, in, in Atlanta with Tyler Perry, uh, amongst other things, including the DL Chronicle, which they produced, uh, which is an award-winning uh, winning, uh, series, web series. And can you talk a little bit about their engagement with the process? For sure. Um, when I was, I conceived of um, these, this adaptation originally as just uh, small pieces that were going to be inserted into uh, the feature length documentary Mood Lavender, which is in production. Um, and I approached the Gosfields with the idea for Congo Cabaret. Uh, in a very limited manner uh, because they were the only black gay couples I knew about. Uh, I had seen their films in, um, in uh, 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 LGBT film festivals. I contacted them, told them what I wanted to do and asked if they knew any young, hungry uh, black directors who would be willing to be underpaid to do this work. <laughs> and they said, well, actually, we'd be interested in doing it. And my jaw hit the floor. I said, really? And they said, yeah, we love this material and we never get a chance to do it. So that was the beginning what has turned out to be a, an extremely fruitful collaboration. And it was under their direction that Congo Cabaret went from a three-page script to a 12-page script, uh, the 15-minute short that's part of the program. And I was um, quite a ride. But... They do beautiful work. They, they really do. Uh, the collaboration has brought on some amazing talent as well. I mentioned before uh, Billy Porter. Uh, we have uh, a, a few other really great, uh, who else is involved in the project? Uh, some of the actors and the Alexandra Gray. Mm -hmm. um, I know you've also worked, you separately have walked, worked with Davi Diggs. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But another person, person that had brought us was, was Kaylin. <laughs> and so, Kaylin, what was your experience? You're in the upcoming feature, which is um, uh, short, the short film Smoke, Liz, and Jade, which we referenced before. Congo Cabaret was the first part, which is featured right now on the Maisel's Documentary Center website as a part of the uh, Queer Harlem Renaissance series. Uh, you were part of the next phase. And so last year we did the shoot in Los Angeles is where we got to really engage with you more. The process of that I found very interesting, the way the Godsfields work, their storytelling. Can you give me a little bit of 
information in terms of from beginning when they brought you into the project and your participation working with them? Oh, sure. Um, I've known the Gossfields for years. So bringing me onto the project was more of a text message, a phone call. Hey, are you free? <laughs> Come by. We're doing this fun thing. Do you have period clothing? Don't worry about it. Bring character <laughs> shoes. Um, which is some of the best, honestly, some of the best work is made under those circumstances, I believe. I think as an artist, you make some of the, your best work working with your friends and working with limited resources. You don't need a ton in order to make good work. Um, so yeah, it was an absolute joy and pleasure working with Quincy and Dee. I mean, their directing style is very specific, but it's like they include you in their vision. You know what I mean? Like it's very, it's a very inclusive set. Everyone feels like family. No one feels like they're, it's not like here's the lead and here's everybody else. Um, it's a very collaborative effort. So I really had a lot of fun working on that uh, short film. I'm so grateful that they asked me to be a part of it. And it led me to Robert, you know? So it, it's, it's lovely working on work where good people meet good people. Great, great. Uh, you know, one of the things when I watch Congo Cabaret and I've seen some of the previews for uh, Smoke, Lilies, and Jade, but when I watch Congo Cabaret, the music influence of it, uh, as a musician myself, I really focused on the sounds and learning about these artists like the Bessie Smiths and Ma Rainey's of the world. Khalil, maybe you can, as a musician yourself, uh, and you've, you have a beautiful cover of Downhearted Blues, which is featured on the shogafilms.com website uh, and that the video is going to be released later. Can you give us some perspective on some of the musical elements uh, that are both in the film and just in regards to the, the, the Harlem Renaissance and how the sexuality really came to light in a lot of those artists? Sure, yeah. So uh, one of the more popular genres that kind of uh, developed at that time in the 1920s was the classic blues, typically uh, black female uh, singers with all male bands. And so Bessie Smith's probably the empress of the blues or queen of the blues, uh, Ma Rainey as well. Um, and a lot of other female uh, songwriters as well, uh, like Alberta Hunter, who all identified uh, as kind of queer or gay or bisexual. Um, uh, there are also a lot of male band leaders like Fletcher Henderson. We have Louis Armstrong was a band member uh, of, of Bessie's. I've been going on some recordings. So uh, black arts were flourishing uh, and black and white audiences were more aware of black music and, and the kind of richness of black music. Um, so what you're hearing is the kind of the flowering really of black popular music. It, it really uh, American as a, as a nation and the international audiences started growing and demanding more of black musicians and black songwriters and the blues was heralded and promoted as a prominent feature of black culture. Great. What, uh, when specifically, I want to talk about, there's a moment in the film. Now, in the prospectus, uh, there, is a, there is a lot of talk about the queer blues divas of the time. Yeah. You mentioned a few, we've mentioned a few of them. Uh, Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith, who I was first introduced years ago through the HBO film, uh, Bessie. Mm -hmm. But the relationship between those two uh, we've talked about the specific point that's actually in one of our previous documentaries called Taint Nobody's Business. Mm -hmm. And a moment in time where Ma Rainey helped Bessie Smith out with mm -hmm. some finances. Now, what I thought about at that time was the kind of how they're, these were like the term says blues divas. Yeah. I look at those artists and I hear these stories and I think about today's divas, mm -hmm. the Beyonce's of the world. Like I said, the Janelle Monet's. you have the, the, how have these artists, how do they relate uh, to these, these blues divas of the 1920s? Yeah, I think they're great role models in history. Um, it speaks to one, what it takes to be a woman in the music industry, which is still a very challenging prospect or to be a woman in the entertainment industry, I should say, in general, and also what's it mean to, what it means to be black in the entertainment industry. Um, 
Gladys Bentley, uh, who's very popular in the New York area, as well as Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, who has a national audience and international audiences, they had attained a level of autonomy in, in a sense because they were so popular and they earned so much money through shrewd business dealings um, and understanding their audience that they could say, you know what, I'm doing things my way. And I think for any artist who's coming up, having that autonomy is important where you can call the shots and have enough uh, courage and pride to say, you know, I think this is the best way to go about doing it. And when you have enough money, I mean, one of the stories is that when Bessie went on tour, she had her own caboose train that she could launch or uh, hook up to main train lines and ride around. That's equivalent to having your own private jet for your own tour. That's how much revenue she had created for herself and that gave her a great amount of power. It's wonderful to know that there are women in history who attained that much power. It's wonderful to know there are black people and black women who attained that much power. Um, and then to see how they negotiated that and how they still had to struggle in different ways. But that negotiation is central for understanding how to navigate this industry uh, as well as navigate your identities. Um, so they're great stories. I'm glad they get out. I'm glad we're kind of adding more to those stories and complicating them by saying, hey, yeah, they're also queer. And they were kind of negotiating that part of their identity too. Kaylin, I saw you not nodding your head there in, in, in solidarity with that comment. Do you have anything you want to add maybe to how that affects you as an artist as well? I mean, I think it's just, it's kind of to the point I made earlier about uh, you have to know where you come from in order to know where you're going. And I think especially as an entertainer, you have to be able to look back and see that other people have done it. You know, like you're not, it's not that you're not the first, it's the fact that someone else has already tread this path for you. And yes, yours is similar, it's not the same, but it is doable, it is possible. You can still achieve your goals and dreams and ambition. Like, uh, I mean, the nearest example I have is Beyonce's documentary, Homecoming, and where she says, I just wanted, to, she basically says, I just want to show other black girls that you can do it too. I'm nothing but country. And if I can do it, you can do it. So I think it's beautiful. And I think in terms of Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey's relationship, I think it's beautiful that they held each other up. You know, they didn't allow the other one to fall because they recognized that they were the only ones looking out. The club dealers aren't gonna look out for you. You know, your manager might look out for you, but that's also shady. So you should be able to turn to your sister or your brother, whoever it is, and say, hey, I need help. And you reach back and you help the next one up because there's room at the table for all of us. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful sentiment too, um, and I and I hope more people understand those stories. That's that is the power of these stories, you know. Um, is it just brings to light so much of, you know, I, I remember S Samson McCormick in the, the the first scene of the series talks about how how much power he felt by just hearing about these, as he calls it, the, the queens of the Harlem Renaissance, you know? So uh, I thought about that a lot and I always think about the term Harlem Renaissance and how synonymous it is with specifically a few, a few individual figures, one of which is Langston Hughes. And, and Anna, I, I wanna talk to you a little bit about Langston and uh, there's been so much conversation and Robert, you can chime in in a, in a minute too, because I know this is something that we spoke about his sexuality has been depicted in so many different ways and argued about in so many different ways. Whereas somebody like Richard Bruce Nugent, who was very open in a lot of ways about his sexuality, uh, and there's some great quotes from him in the piece. How, how, do, you, how do you review that in the literature? Right, so I haven't uh, written specifically on Hughes, but I did read the letters that he wrote to uh, Locke and that wrote, uh, Locke wrote to him. So clearly um, Langston Hughes was interested in exploring different options. Uh, so he, for example, they had these conversations about Walt Whitman's uh, poems that celebrated friendship. Uh, so uh, Locke would recommend these to Hughes and the very fact that Hughes would ask about these poems would indicate his interest in, um, uh, in men, basically. Um, also what, uh, what uh, Locke did uh, was uh, recommend, I don't know if it's visible, oh, I haven't mirrored my, uh, uh, my camera. So uh, there was uh, this LGBT, early LGBT movement back then 
in Great Britain and in Germany. And uh, one of the activists and writers and poets of the movement, Edward Carpenter, published an anthology of friendship. She, he called that. And it was a collection of classical, canonical Western texts from ancient Greece until Whitman, precisely, that celebrated male friendship. So uh, when Locke uh, recommended uh, such, uh, such books to Hughes, uh, this was a way of expressing uh, a desire for men and uh, sort of uh, encouraging Hughes to, to pursue, uh, pursue that. However, I do not have uh, any um, and uh, so I, I think that looking for Langston interprets uh, Langston's sexuality in a, a more concrete way than there, there is, uh, than it is, it shows from his letters. So Robert, I know you wanted to, to chime in as well. I think you're muted there. Um, but we've had conversations, Robert and I have, about Langston as well. Um, and one of the things that I know that we discussed is the, like I said, the kind of back and forth argument of, of Langston's sexuality and, and the importance of that in the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, um, I, uh, I can speak to that. Um, it's a question that was more important to me earlier than it is now because I've come to a kind of a, resol a, a resolution uh, that, uh, uh, that, that works for me and which will find its way into uh, Mood Lavender. There have been, uh, the official biographer of uh, Langston Hughes was Arnold Rampersand. He wrote a two-volume biography on Hughes. And so any possible sexual encounter that Hughes had during his life been in those pages of their of that book and what of those books and what comes out is that he came back from an overseas trip with a case of VD <laughs> so we know he had sex at least once but in terms of um incontroversial incontrovertible evidence of uh, sexual activity with men or women, we have no reliable uh, sources. Langston himself claimed heterosexual adventures, but once again, there's no proof of the matter. I do claim, and of course, there continues to be, he's fierce, Langston is fiercely uh, adopted by the Black, by many black LGBT uh, people as being one of their own. And there is controversy on the other side as well. I don't think we're ever gonna have a satisfactory answer to whether or not he actually slept with other men, but I do claim him as queer. And the reason that I do is because it's clear that he was not heterosexual. Uh, if he had been heterosexual, he would have, he was a beautiful man. He was very famous, uh, Harlem's most eligible bachelor for decades. He would have had women and he never did. So whatever his um, sexuality was, uh, he was queer. And, and Khalil, uh... I think we've talked a little bit about this before as well. Um, do you, you know, a lot of people might say, why does this matter in terms of sexuality, in terms of the arts? Do you feel that, especially after watching the piece, outside of the representation, do you think that, it, that the defining aspects of sexuality really can, can produce can can really filter into the content in a way that gives it that gives it more uh, in terms of understanding the human aspects of of the work in the art. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yes, and I think 
a powerful thing that I came across in, in Hughes's early poetry um, while teaching in a high school setting was this knowledge and perspective of cabaret life and nightlife in Harlem. And in many of those poems, he talks about um, men who are abusing their female partners. He talks about dark-skinned women and the kind of colorism and issues of interracial prejudice they face. He talks about sex workers. He has this eye on all the taboo topics within the black community that we don't want to talk about, uh, of which you know, queer sexuality or non-heteronormative behavior is included. So I think Hughes is important as a queer figure, as a figure with this knowledge of non-heteronormative sexualities, um, because he gives us this window into what's going on. He talks about the taboo subjects. He's not afraid to go there and give us that perspective. And so whether he's an ally or a queer member, I think it's just important to have that perspective. Um, and he's not afraid to give us that perspective. That perspective is a part of why he was taking part in you know, the one issue of fire, uh, because there are things that we, we should talk about that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about, and they're very useful. And queerness comes under that umbrella sometimes as being a taboo topic. I hope that answers the question. The answer the question. No, that totally answers the question. <laughs> this has been a really great discussion. I have, before we turn it over to uh, the open Q&A for our panelists, I just want to ask one last thing is, you know, watching the film that runs around 36 minutes, uh, the series features, I believe it is five separate pieces. Uh, both documentary style, short film narratives, as well as a few interviews and poems. Uh, first, I'll start with Kaylin. What was the one thing that you grasped from watching the piece that you really hope that people walk away with? Oh, um, one thing I really hope people grasp. My biggest thing while watching the piece was the fact that this is our first time hearing a lot of these stories. And as an artist, as a black artist, I, it just kind of lit a fire where I was like, these stories really just need to be told and they need to be heard. Um, so I hope when people watch it, one, they recognize that, you know, black people have always been excellent and great. You know, uh, outside, I think at one point in the film, I can't remember where it is or who says it, but there's a clip of someone staying there switching the narrative. Um, so I think that I just want people to walk away from it, recognizing that no matter what the media says about us, you can always switch the narrative of what you think about us. And you know, dive into our history and, and take a look at what that looks like. Um, and then don't be afraid to tell our stories. You know, like, don't be afraid to give us a green light to tell our stories. I think that's the biggest thing. Like, there's an audience for everything. And I really want this to hit the, the top decision makers so they give us the grace and space to do so. And Anna, I want to ask you the same question, but with the filter on it from uh, the perspective of coming from it as an international academic, again, uh, and really, what do you think that you would take away from the piece, but also, uh, what do you think that the international community needs to know about the Harlem Renaissance, and especially, specifically the queer Harlem Renaissance? <clears throat> right. Um... So um, for me personally, the, the today, the, uh, the 36 minutes, from the 36 minutes that I have seen, uh, the, the um, part uh, of Congo Cabaret was uh, the, uh, the part that made uh, the biggest impact on me uh, because I thought it uh, perfectly visualizes uh, the notion of the interzone that uh, some historians claim that Harlem uh, constituted in the 1920s so this place that was not as policed as uh, more downtown areas and after the progressive uh, era reforms uh, you know all the vice uh, was moved uh, was mm, moved uh, away from, uh, from from white districts and from uh, from the downtown so uh, it was and it moved uh, to uh, black districts and lower class districts working class districts um, and uh, obviously uh, it was 
uh, a disadvantage in many ways, but it was also an advantage because the fact that it was not as policed enabled this expression of different sexualities that would not be possible in other places. Uh, so so the, the Congo cabaret was, was really something that, um, that perfectly uh, shows that. Um, as far as international audiences uh, are concerned, I think that um, the, the Harlem Renaissance is not as famous, uh, the literature of it, as the music, right? So uh, everyone knows Bessie Smith, uh, but not really many people uh, read uh, novels by Claude Marquet or, or Nella Larsen. So bringing that, uh, bringing um, the literature rather than only music of the 1920s uh, to places such as Poland is something that uh, that I find uh, really important. Great, thank you so much. I want to I want to turn this over. Before we turn it over to questions from the audience, I want to say thank you again to the Maisel Documentary Center for hosting us today. Uh, this hour-long conversation has been great. We're going to do 15 minutes uh, from participants in our crowd and our virtual crowd. Thank you, Robert and Khalil for, you know, working on these projects and producing this. Thank you, Kaylin, for being a part of the team and Anna for inputting and, and being a part and teaching this internationally. And thank you to everybody who's interested in this subject, who's pushing these conversations forward. Uh, we need to have these conversations. One of the things that I leave with is how important representation and uh, communication around these subjects are to really give us a sense of an, of perspective of where we've come from. So with that said, uh, there's a question from one of our Instagram followers who has joined in. Uh, we're gonna give the next 15 minutes, like I said. Uh, I know that we have some people who need to step away shortly, but uh, this, this uh, first question is a general question for the full team. So if, you're, if you want to uh, respond, please just let us know. It is due from Roxy Brown. And it is, do you think that segregation in Harlem caused the arts to flourish or to be suppressed? And do you think black arts are thriving now or are they still being suppressed or are they suppressed? I'm, I'm gonna repeat the question just one more time. Uh, do you think that segregation in Harlem caused the arts to flourish or to be suppressed? And then the second part to the question is, do you think that black arts are thriving now or are they suppressed? Can I take a stab at that question? Sure, um, go ahead, Khalil. Thank you. I, don't think I have a great answer. I just have more text to look at. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Calvin Becton, who is a white ally of the Renaissance. He's a, uh, he helped Langston Hughes get his publishing contract. Um, he photographed lots of people. He had these integrated parties where he brought people from different communities, including the black community, to meet folks kind of. Um, create alliances across different spaces. Um, so he really kind of worked against the ideas of segregation in the, in the industry. Um, but he has this problematic novel called, and I'll say inward heaven, I'm not gonna say the full word. <laughs> um, but I think his novel is an effort and he really, he, he, he did what he did, what, his, what he thought was his best at the time to get a, a picture of what black life in Harlem is like, which I think is a bit stereotyped in, in the way he portrays it, but he also gets to the a window as to what, it likes, what it's like to be a black artist and tell the truth or your own personal truth about your own experience. Um, and so I think that novel gets a bit edited as well as reading other novels uh, and poems by other uh, folks in the Renaissance um, to get to that question. Just say, I don't have an answer to that question, but I think there's something beautiful to piggyback on something Kaylin said earlier, when we can be in solidarity and support each other. I think that's super important. So whether segregation is legally enforced or it's, voluntary, it's a voluntary act, I think it's important when we create networks of solidarity to support each other and hold each other up. And that's very important, I would say, within the arts. To be an artist is still to be a working class person or citizen in, in this country, especially without good health care. So you need those networks to hold you up and support you because there are times when you have some work and there are times when you don't. Um, so that's my answer to that question. I'm not sure that I really gets at it, but that's my input. Uh, I actually want to piggyback on something there, if you don't mind. I'll take off my narrator, uh, my moderator hat for a second. Uh, as an artist myself, I think that, you know, when I look at segregation and how it affected Black people in terms of, I think struggle just breeds creativity in a lot of ways. And so when I reference the film, 
learning a little bit more about the the, the piece of, of Nigerati Manor, the Fire uh, magazine. These are great outlets. I don't know if it's suppressed or, f- but I but I do know that struggle brings greatness sometimes. And to answer the question of flourish or suppress, I think arts artists are constantly flourishing, uh, no matter what their what their um, struggles are. And I think that that's important to to be aware of how you know the power of people, and the power of their ability to communicate. What it does suppress is sometimes who gets to receive that. And that's the unfortunate part. Um, but it's amazing to me that, you know, here we are decades later and someone in Poland can be on this panel talking about African-American literature in a place that I'm from and that I identify with so much. And, you know, I, I keep the question open so anyone else can, can kind of chime in. If not, we can go to the next question, okay? And the next question is actually for, uh, this is a question for Kaylin from, um, I think it's Astarte Howell, I, I believe is how you pronounce it. Uh, Kaylin, uh, Mr. Howell asked, or how do you think the popularity of the Harlem Renaissance will affect the roles available to black and queer actors? Great question. How do I think the popularity? Can you repeat that one more time for me? Sure, no problem. How do you think the popularity of the Harlem Renaissance, and I, I'm guessing that they mean specifically, you know, the queer aspects of it, will affect the roles available to Black and queer actors? I mean, I think that it's going to do amazing work for us. Uh, I think that, like I said earlier, I think that the popularity, it has to reach the people that are in the powers of decision-making. Um, example, I have a friend that's wrote a beautiful script. Uh, it is absolutely astounding. It's a pilot episode. And it is a story of Black folk in the Harlem Renaissance. And it doesn't end in tragedy. It's a drama, it's gritty. It's something that I would watch. I think that in Hollywood though, we are, I'm trying to think of how to say this in like the nicest internet friendly way possible. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think that Hollywood has a habit of thinking that the only way they can tell black stories is through black trauma. Um, mm whether that's slavery or, you know, the one to two, three civil rights movies that we get with the same people, uh, or it's something recent, but it always ends in someone getting shot and someone dying and it's, it's draining. So I think that if we can tell more stories from our history and it doesn't have to be so traumatic, for lack of a better term. Um, I think that that would do a great deal. I think that it would open so many doors and it would open up doors for the generation that's under us. Because they would know that, you know, hey, here's some other cool stuff that we as a people that your great, great grandma did when they were living in Harlem. You know, this is why you're musically inclined. This is why you feel the need to be on Broadway. Like. I think, so yeah, to answer the question, I think that it would do tremendously for us. Can I, can I jump on here? Sure. Guess what? They had this conversation back, in, back during the Harlem Renaissance, this exact same conversation. When Elaine Locke published The New Negro, he said, we are not a problem anymore. We are not a ward of the states. We are not the Freedman's Bureau. We are not a problem. We are artists. We contribute vitally to American culture. American culture would be nothing without our contribution. And what we have is nothing but positive. It's a battle that never stops being fought. I can't speak to that. The others can. But, but I do want to point out that 
this was first brought up in the Harlem Renaissance by the queer publicist, Elaine Lott. Great. Um, we have a comment I want to address. I uh, just want to tell everybody, thank you for showcasing. This is from Loanne Nugent. And Loanne says, thank you for showcasing this piece of LGTP, um, LGBTQ plus history. It is so rich. I know it is recorded. Where will this recording be held for me to share and watch it again? And I just want to state that this piece is now available on the Maisel Documentary Center website uh, through the end of the month. We, for additional information, uh, you can check out www.shogafilms.com and keep in touch with us through our social media channels as well. Um, I do have another question after that said. I I'm going to let Anna, I think this one might be good for you. Dr. Elaine Locke, uh, this is another question from Roxy Brown, by the way. Dr. Elaine Locke, per the documentary, mentioned the culture was advanced when personal inclinations were suppressed. Do you agree at all? And do you want me to repeat <clears throat> the question? I, do, um, are these artists' personal inclinations that are supposed to be suppressed? Uh, do you think that there was suppression? I think, I think the question's in relation to the work. Do you think that, that the culture was at all suppressed, uh, the, the art was at all suppressed due to the time period? Uh, black art. It, it was the first time probably when, uh, when, it wa uh, when it could flourish, right? Because in the 1920s you had, um, well, uh, you had a primitivist modernism. So people uh, at the very beginning of the 20th century, like Picasso, for example, were fascinated with African art uh, and they turned it into their own high art. Uh, and it translated into uh, the popularity of black culture in the US, right? African-American culture, which was perceived as related to, uh, to African culture uh, in a very direct way. So Locke actually wanted to take advantage of this association. He doubted that there is really as direct connection as people sometimes thought, right? African-American is not the same as African. Nevertheless, he uh, encouraged black artists to explore their connections with Africa, imaginary or not. Um, so actually because, in a way, because of this popularity of uh, non-Western cultures that were perceived as this new source of inspiration for white uh, artists, African-American culture um, got a lot of attention and got a lot of money, right? This is the first time that we had uh, fellowships and, uh, uh, and we, have, uh, we have stipends for, for black artists and so many took advantage of it. Um, great. Uh, we're coming towards the end here. I, I wanna give some time to everybody to, I think that's, I think that's pretty much the majority of our questions. We have some, some more. Um, if there's any more, now would be the time to submit them. Um, but I'm, I want to start wrapping it up in terms of giving everybody just the last statement regarding the, the films, the projects, uh, the work of the work of arts, the, the topic. Uh, and I want to start with Khalil. Do you have anything that you would like to add to the conversation uh, in regards to your last statements of the queer Harlem Renaissance today? Um, I think it, the, the particular time we're in with the coronavirus and sheltering in place, um, people have seen how important it is to kind of tune in to streaming media. Uh, and there are things beyond Netflix and Amazon. There's so many other streaming media available, especially through public libraries. Um, I just encourage folk to tweet, to complain, to talk, to spread the word about this project and seeing more projects that represent uh, more diverse perspectives on the black community. I just piggybacking what Caitlin said, um, those are vital to see. They're so enriching and, and important for us as a black community and for people uh, and for uh, all audiences to see. So uh, just demand more and demand better um, from the folks in charge or to start doing it ourselves. 
Thank you, Khalil. I also want to highlight you for a second. Your work has been amazing. Thank you so much for being uh, a great spokesperson for the organization, a great producer. Uh, I really enjoyed your interview uh, with the Spectrum Lounge, where you talk about the projects, uh, the subject matter. Uh, thank you again so much for your voice, your time. Uh, and if anybody hasn't gotten a chance to, to review that interview, it's available on the shogafilms.com website. Uh, Khalil Sullivan, our producer, did an amazing interview with the Spectrum Lounge. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Kaylin, I'll, I'll give you a chance to give your last, uh, your last hurrah <laughs> uh, in terms of the, the project, but it won't be the last time we hear from you either. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in, in Smoke Lunes and Jade later this year, uh, the trailers, and, and hopefully we get some amazing film festivals and we get to see each other in real space. And uh, yeah, I just want to hear your last comments. Yeah, um, I, I too am looking forward to the day we all get to share space. Um, my last comment, uh, I would say just be curious, be curious, be interested in things outside of yourself, do your research. Since we're all stuck at home, read a book, read some stuff, do that. Um, Google is your friend. Uh, what else? Also, if anyone does know a higher up industry exec, um, tell them that Black people also enjoy period pieces. The yes. Harlem Renaissance is technically a period piece. We enjoy seeing ourselves in clothing that we are not currently wearing today from the 80s or the 90s. Um, I, too, love a good, you know, Jane Austen-esque piece. Uh, I love a scar face. So if Black and brown bodies can also occupy that space, it would be greatly appreciated because we have dope stories that need to be told, need to be shared. And then that way people have like, I know kids have something else to watch in their US history and social studies classes. So that's my ending parting words for everyone. We appreciate that so much. Uh, personally, that, that resonates because of the fact that we have uh, such a, sh one of my, my company, Afronaut Media, one of our uh, kind of mantras is to, create a better future by honoring the past. And I think a lot of times black history, like you said, is so traumatized in its past presentation, uh, how it's presented now. Look forward to new stories, more diverse stories, more inclusive stories. Thank you so much for being a part of our panel. I know you have to head out, so I'm gonna give you some permission if you wanna leave a little earlier, but thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing from you soon again. Um, and keep in mind, I'm gonna be posting, uh, we're gonna be doing a blog post on our social, on our social media and our website with everybody's contact information if you want to follow and see other projects that Kaylin and Khalil are in, uh, as well as Anna, who I want to give you the floor for your final words. Thank you so much for joining us internationally all the way from uh, Warsaw, Poland. And we are we appreciate your 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 zest and your insight in terms of the not just the literary elements, but also your experience with the with the um, topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. It has been uh, a great, um, great conversation. So uh, the only thing I can do is agree with, uh, uh, with what has been said. So uh, there has been this famous TED talk by uh, Adikchi about the danger of a single story. We need more stories and this is the kind of story that's not uh, typically thought of when you think about African-American culture and African-American history that precisely has been limited by this regime of uh, authenticity of traumatic history. So um, this is the story that we definitely need. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Again, we, we look forward. Where can we check out some of your works? Uh, I think you shared with us some information, but uh, if you can quickly do a plug for maybe some of your, uh, I know you have some pieces that are out right now, a book, I believe. Uh, so I, I wrote a book about the Harlem Renaissance, the making of the new Negro. Uh, and now I'm, um, yes, the, the, the University of Georgia, Press will release my book on uh, women's African-American fiction, uh, 19th century fiction. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Khalil, are you, are you there right now? Um, I wanted to actually ask you one last thing as well. Um, your music and your knowledge of music is so influential in the, in the piece. Uh, I know you're a musician and we have some great footage and uh, releases from you as well. Where can we check out some more of your music? Yeah, you can go to madnoisemusic.com to check out uh, one of the bands I play with, Mad Noise. Um, we've done some great work touring with the State Department in West Africa, and our latest album for my mother uh, is on that. Uh, you can also check out the Truants uh, at Bandcamp. They're a punk band I play with. We just released a new album as well. Um, so yeah, those are the places. Great, great. And so uh, I do want to uh, bring in one last question. And it's in regards to, uh, for Robert, uh, and I'm going to let you put this uh, into your final, final thoughts here as well. Um, Robert, first and foremost, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for organizing Shoga Films and as uh, the principal filmmaker, bringing these stories to light, which we all agree are, are greatly, greatly needed in our culture. Um, one of the things that I, I think someone asked offline is in regards to David Diggs, who narrated the piece, his involvement. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about your history, how David got involved that you can include in there, and then how this whole project, I know you have a very vast, uh, a vast story behind how, how your early works came into the newer works and the development of Shogun Films. Looks like you're muted there again, Robert. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still fairly new with this technology. <laughs> um, David's father and I were, uh, were romantic partners in the 90s. So I knew David from the time he was in eighth grade. Um, and uh, I've been, uh, his father is a member of his father. His father is a member of my family. I'm a member of David's family. Uh, before he blew up in Hamilton, I was uh, learning my craft as a filmmaker and I asked him to do some, uh, some work for me. So that was when he laid down the narration for uh, the prospectus. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that's how he came to be involved with that particular uh, project. Um, he, uh, of course, he, he's gone on to have a huge career. Um, his uh, uh, latest series, in which he stars Snowpiercer, just debuted last Sunday on TNT. And uh, I'm sure that'll do extremely well. Shall I segue into my final remarks? Sure, please. Yeah. Um, so everything that has been brought up, all of the issues were... Uh, aired uh, eloquently and thoroughly during the period of the Harlem Renaissance. So anybody who's interested in um, looking at the history of current discussions, controversies, can go back to the 1920s and you, they will find texts that reflect all of this. It's an extremely rich period and there's still a lot of excavation uh, and contextualization to be done. The part that we're concentrating on, the queer part, is informative, it's central, but it's not the whole story, clearly. No particular perspective or issue or point of view is the whole story. It's rich, multifarious, and complex. Um, there are um, successful uh, products of popular culture that reflect uh, the, uh, the, excuse me, there are uh, cultural products that reflect the complexity of the Harlem Renaissance that have been celebrated. Just to mention a few, uh, there was the miniseries Self Made about Madam C.J. Walker on Netflix uh, uh, last month, and uh, it brought in a, a, a lesbian theme and a very uh, somewhat historically inaccurate, but a very pronounced way. Uh, the film Bessie, starring Queen Latifah, about the life of Bessie Smith. HBO came out a few years ago. 
uh, directed by Dee Reese, who was the first black lesbian director to have a commercially released film uh, on, uh, uh, in wide release. That was not Bessie, it was uh, her debut film, Pariah. But uh, she's gone on to have uh, a wonderfully remarkable career. Um, and then in the academic circles, uh, the biography of Elaine Locke, The New Negro, won last year's National Book Award and Pulitzer Prize. So um, there are certain parts of the Harlem Renaissance that are getting translated into uh, wider recognition for sure. We're doing our part. Um, and I wanna just mention what's possible uh, to be uh, viewed now. We didn't have, we, we made the documentary about the queer divas of the 1920s, Tain Nobody's Business, which can be uh, rented or downloaded from Vimeo on demand, or if you still have a DVD, purchase the DVD, you can do that from uh, the Shogo Films website. Uh, so that uh, goes uh, pretty deeply into that world. And then uh, in the fall, uh, we will be building a campaign, Marcus will be building a campaign around the release of Congo Cabaret. So there's gonna be a lot of information around that and we're excited about that. Not to mention the fact that post, uh, Smoke, Lilies and Jade is in post-production. I had a little bit of a internet connection issue. Am I still here? Yes. Okay, great. Just wanted to double check. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Robert. Again, thank you for your work. You, Khalil, uh, Anna, thank you for joining us. Uh, as a final note, I do want to say thank you one last time to the Maisel Documentary Center for hosting us here on this live virtual, live stream virtual uh, Q&A and discussion, panel discussion. Uh, please check out Queer Harlem Renaissance, our series, available now through their platform online. Uh, it's available through the end of the month. And outside of that, we're getting some messages saying they can't wait for the release of Congo Cabaret. <laughs> so if you're interested in learning more about our projects and uh, our work, please follow us on social media at Shoga Films on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as our website and blog, www.shogafilms.com. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate you. Be safe, be well, be healthy, and keep, keep pushing the movement and the, and the voices forward. Thank you very much.